as the kids are going, I want to invite the rest of you to open up your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. We're continuing on in our epic journey through the book of Exodus. And this morning we come to a very famous chapter, chapter 32. By the way, if you'd like to use one of the pew Bibles provided for you in the pew racks in front of you, you'll find our text today begins on page 72 of those editions. Exodus 32. As I said, this is a famous chapter. Maybe it's even one of the most famous chapters in all of the book of Exodus, maybe even all of the Bible, because it is in this chapter that the people of Israel make a golden calf, an idol. And it's one of those stories that as you read it, it almost makes you angry because you think to yourself, aren't these the very people who got to experience the miracles of the Lord God? Didn't they see all of those plagues inflicted on the Egyptians? Weren't these the very people that got to watch the Red Sea part in two and then they walked through it on dry land? Weren't these the people that got to eat that miracle food, that, mir- that manna that God provided on the desert floor day by day by day? But then they get into this situation where Moses goes up on the mountain. He disappears in that cloud and they get impatient. And after all the things they've experienced, what do they do? Well, they, they make this golden calf and bow down and worship it. You think to yourself, how dare they? Or maybe we should say, how dare we? Because this is my premise this morning. You and I make and craft and bow down to idols in our lives too. You and I make God substitutes that we give our hearts away to all day long. You and I are idol addicts and we need help. So this morning I would ask you, do you want help in facing and conquering the idols in your life that compete with your affection for God? If you're ready for help, our text is helpful because it shows us four steps that you need to take if you want to defeat idols in your life. Four steps that you need to take if you want to defeat the idols in your life. So let's take a look at these four steps as we work through the account together. Here's the first step. If you want to defeat the idols in your life, you must first admit the reality of idolatry in your life. You must admit the reality of idolatry in your life. Look at chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a crafting tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. See, here's the problem. Moses had disappeared into the cloud on that mountain. And he didn't seem to be coming back at least from the people's perspective, they panicked. For all they knew, Moses was dead up on that mountain. And it was time to take matters into their own hands. They needed something to focus their energies on, something to lead them, something to worship. They needed something tangible, something they could see, touch, something they could adore. So they surrounded Aaron and pressured him into making a God that they could really get behind. It's not like the people wanted to completely throw out the Lord God. It's not like they wanted to throw out Yahweh altogether. No, they just wanted to keep him around, but modify him a bit, update him, 
Merge him together with the gods that they were used to, the gods like they were back in Egypt. Remember that the Egyptians venerated their cattle. They worshipped the god Apis, who was believed to inhabit a live bull. They worshipped the goddess Hathor, goddess of motherhood, who was represented with the head of a cow. The Egyptians had all kinds of gods and goddesses that were rendered with cow-like features. So it's no wonder that the Israelites made a golden calf. They took what they knew and they merged it together with the God that Moses claimed to know. This was syncretism. And notice that Aaron even calls the calf Yahweh. Look there in verse 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. That's the English rendering for the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. So there's Aaron looking at the golden calf saying, Tomorrow we will hold a feast to Yahweh. You see what he was doing? You see what they were doing? Notice, he he builds an altar in front of the calf. They they offer burnt offerings and, and peace offerings, and they celebrate a feast before it. These were all things that they were supposed to do only for Yahweh, but here they're doing it for the golden calf. And maybe worst of all, the people actually give credit for the exodus to the golden calf. They give credit to this idol for the things that God had actually done. Notice in verse 4, the people point to the calf and they say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Here's what they're doing. They are imputing the one true God's attributes and actions into this statue. And then they're worshiping the statue rather than God. They're giving the statue God's attributes and then worshiping the statue rather than him. And this leads us to the definition of idolatry. Idolatry happens any time that you impute godlike attributes into a person or something or some ideal, and then you look to that thing to find what only God can actually give you. So when a man looks to his work to find ultimate significance and value, that work becomes a god to him, an idol, and he will sacrifice anything for it. When a teenage girl fixates on a young man and believes that her life And her value are defined by whether he pays attention to her. She's given that boy godlike attributes and he becomes an idol to her. Good things in our lives can become idols when we make them ultimate things. Things like kids and your home and your possessions and your health. For instance, take exercise. That's a good thing. But it can become a god. When your vain obsession with your body and your appearance become everything to you and it owns you, it becomes an idol. Other idols are intrinsically evil. Think about it. When a person gives themselves over to pornography, you realize, don't don't you, that it's not ultimately about sex. It's about a God-sized hole that that person feels in their heart that they're trying to fill or maybe just escape the pain of that void for a little bit by looking at images on a screen. They're enslaved to a counterfeit God. In all these examples, which we could multiply out a thousand times, the same thing happens. Here's what we do. We impute God-like attributes into someone or something, and then we adore and serve and give our lives to it as a God. That's what the Israelites were doing. Yahweh had rescued them. Yahweh could lead them to the promised land. Yahweh had given them the significance and the love that they really needed. But they decided that Yahweh wasn't good enough for them and their affections. And so they imputed his attributes into this little idol and then bowed down and worshipped it. Tim Keller defines modern idolatry this way. He says, The human heart takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Our hearts deify them as the center of our lives because we think they can give us significance and security, safety and fulfillment if we attain them. Anything in life can serve as an idol, a God alternative, a counterfeit God. 
If anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life, and identity, then it is an idol. See, here's what Keller is saying. Idolatry is not just an ancient problem. It's a human problem. It's a universal problem. It's our problem. Idolatry, furthermore, is not just a pagan problem. It's actually a Christian problem, too, do you realize? As the people of God, we face idols, too. And so if you read this story and you find yourself rather annoyed by the Israelites because they would abandon and so quickly trade in the one true God for a silly idol, then you should also feel frustrated and annoying with us because we, too, trade in the love of a God that we know in Christ for our own obsession with silly idols. And we really love our idols, don't we? And we just love them. (laughs) We're like, I love my precious little idol. I just want to squeeze it, pick it up, (laughs) carry it with me everywhere I go. I just find all my security and my identity and my happiness in this, this, holy cow, you know? And it's just... And we should laugh at ourselves, right? Because as you think about it, it really is so ironic. We bow down to our material possessions and do anything to keep them. We bow down to our public image and do anything to make sure we keep it up. We bow down to people that we're obsessed with and we'll do anything to make them adore us. And we just polish our golden calves and stroke them and adore them. Again, to quote Tim Keller, he says, quote, idols capture our imagination and we can locate them by looking at our daydreams. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you, what idols do you worship? And notice, I'm not saying, do you worship idols? I'm asking, what idols do you tend to worship? Do you tend to make and then bow down to in place of the one true living God? What people or things or goals or ideas have captured your imagination and your daydreams to such an extent that you feel that you could never go on without them? If you lost that idol, what would you do? How could you possibly live? What God substitutes in your life do you sacrifice your money and your time and your affections to? What precious golden calves do you run to for ultimate meaning in your life? See, we need to understand that worship is the default position of the human heart. We're all worshipers all the time. And idolatry is not just an ancient problem, it's our problem. And the first step in defeating idols in your life is to admit that they're really there. That's the first step. Admit the reality of idolatry in your life. And then here's the second step. The second step in defeating idols is to see the greatness of God's love over against the futility of your idols. Let me say that again. See the greatness of God's love over against the futility of God of your idols. The next scene in our text takes us back up the mountain where God, who is omnipresent and all-knowing, knows what's happening down below. Look with me, beginning in verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, 
With evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all that this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Huh. What an interesting dialogue between the Lord and Moses, right? And there are basically two ways that you can interpret this dialogue. One way is to see this as the angry God over against the loving Moses. This interpretation goes something like this. Here's God, sees what's happening down below, and he is absolutely furious, and justly so. And God is like someone about to engage in a fight. He's just in a rage. He's ready to go down the mountain and wipe these people out. But in steps Moses to hold God back and say, no, 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 hold on a second, God, hold on. You need to see this from a different perspective. And then Moses effectively persuades God to see it from a different angle and change his mind. It's angry God over against loving Moses, all right? That's one view. I think that there is another view of this dialogue that makes more sense. Think carefully with me for a second. In this second view, God sees the wickedness and rebellion down below, and he is rightly and justly angry. And he expresses that just anger to Moses, stating that he has every right to wipe these people out. The payment for idolatrous sin is death, right? But then God invites Moses in a very subtle way to make the case if there is in fact some way for God to show them mercy. Look at verse 10. Notice what God says. God says, now therefore, Moses, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. Why does God even make that statement? Why does he even say to Moses, let me alone? Why doesn't he just go ahead and do it? Here's why. Because when God says to Moses, let me alone, it is an implicit invitation not to let God alone. God is coaxing. He's like, Moses, let me alone. Come on over and make a case. If you don't let me alone, make a case for why I should show them mercy. And that's exactly what Moses does. He makes a case. He says, God, don't destroy this people. Don't forget they are your people. Your people who you love with a redemptive love that has rescued them from slavery in Egypt. Don't eliminate these people. Remember, God, they are bound up with your very glory. Your reputation is bound up with theirs. Don't destroy your people, God. Remember your promises that you made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Promises that include these people in their fulfillment. Be faithful to your people, O oh God. Moses makes a case. And in summary form, Moses is saying to God, God, there are greater realities than these people's sin. God, your redeeming love for them, your concern for your glory, your faithfulness to your promises, these are all greater realities than their sin. So it should drive you to show them mercy and forgiveness and grace. And here's the thing. God is pleased with Moses' arguments. And so he shows the people mercy as he intended to do all along. God didn't want to destroy his people. He loves them. They're bound up with him. And so he invites Moses in a roundabout way to make the case. Moses prays in line with God's will. And as one commentator puts it, we are not to think of Moses as altering God's purposes toward Israel by his prayer. But we are to think of Moses as carrying out God's purposes through his prayer. Do you see in this text the relentless love of God for his people? God had every right to wipe the people out. He should have wiped them out. He had rescued them from slavery. He had shown them miracles and provision. He had given them his good law. He had promised them a bright future. And here they were, breaking the law, slapping God in his face, giving their allegiance to a stupid golden calf. He should have wiped them out. He had every just reason to wipe them out. But no, God is pleased to listen to the logic of a mediator, Moses. And God is pleased to respond to his people 
with mercy because of his redeeming love, because of his glory, because of his faithfulness to his promises. God's relentless love in this story is greater than the people's sin. That's the point. And it's the same with us, brothers and sisters, in our idolatry. When we bow down to this idol or that, when we give our heart away to counterfeit gods, we have a heavenly father who is pleased to listen to the prayers of his son, Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who always lives to make intercession for us. So the next time you fall to one of those same old idols, you need to think on the day after when you fall, think about God the Father who now looks to God the Son and remembers that he has redeemed you from slavery to sin and death through the cross. And God the Father looks at God the Son and remembers that his very glory is bound up with your life now. And God the Father looks to God the Son and remembers that every one of his promises is yes to you in Christ. So he resolves to be faithful to you, even in the face of your idols. What I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is that you're never going to find any other love that is relentless, as relentless as God's love is for you. What other love is this loyal? What other love is this faithful? What other love is this persistent? It's the love of God in Christ. We see it in our text. We see it in our lives as God relates to us in Christ. And I want you to just compare God's love with the futility of our idols. I mean, look what happens next in the story. Moses comes down from the mountain. Uh-oh, verse 30, chapter 32, verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. On his way down from the mountain, Moses hears the sound of pagan revelry that is so loud and, is, and, and it is so full of activity that Joshua actually thinks a war has broken out. That's how hard these people were partying. They're singing and dancing and shouting and feasting and getting drunk and sexual immorality, to be sure. It was a drunken, wild party of the first degree. And Moses crashes the party with the righteous anger of God. In a public symbolic act of protest, he lifts up the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on them and dashes them to the floor where they crash into a million pieces. It was a way of demonstrating that the people had broken their covenant with God. It was a way of saying they don't even deserve God's laws. And then Moses does a second thing, a second public symbolic act. He melts down well, first he burns and then melts down the golden calf, grinds it to powder, sprinkles it into the water supply, and makes the people drink it. You say, what in the world is that all about? Here's what it's all about. As they drank that bitter water, they would think to themselves, how futile is this idol? I mean, it promised me the world, and now it's just given me a stomach ache. I mean, as that gold dust that they had drank eventually came out in the form of human waste, the people would think to themselves, that golden calf is about as valuable as this gold speckled refuse. Completely useless for my life. See, Moses was illustrating something that's always true of idols. Idols always make God-sized promises to us that they cannot keep. In the end, they're shown to be empty, painful, futile, gold dust on the ground. 
We see this today all the time. It happens, for instance, when you buy the latest gadget that you think is finally going to change your life and give you deep fulfillment. And you buy the 2.0 version because it's the very best on the market. And you finally get it and open the box and hold this gadget in your hand. And then the very next day they come out with 3.0. And suddenly this thing that was supposed to give you all the fulfillment that you need. It's just futile. It's just gold dust on the ground. Or I think of the athlete who worships their sport and gives everything of their life to it. But then they have some kind of accident where they're unable to play anymore. And in those cases, so often you see that those athletes are absolutely devastated because their sport was everything in their life. It made God-sized promises to them, but then it could not fulfill them. In fact, sometimes it's actually when we catch all the idols that we're chasing that we finally find they are so futile and so empty. I think of this, uh, this striking interview that took place a handful of years ago where Tom Brady was on six, 60 Minutes. Uh, by that time, Tom Brady was about 30 years old. He had won three Super Bowl rings. He just signed another $60 million contract. Okay, so this guy is like on top of the world. And he looks at the interviewer and he says, I quote, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? Maybe a lot of people would say, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me? I think there's got to be more than this. That's a guy who has it all. That's a guy who holds every imaginable golden calf in his arms. And he's still saying, there's got to be more than this. See, idols make God-sized promises, but they can never keep them. They're futile. And sometimes when you catch your idols, that's when you realize how futile they really are. And so here's the point for you and me, me brothers and sisters. We need to do some comparison work. In our fight against idols, we have to compare the relentless, overwhelming love of God for us in Christ on the one hand with the futility of our idols on the other. Your idols can't give you ultimate meaning, but God certainly can. Your idols can't truly satisfy your hungry soul, but God can feed you through and through. Your idols will abandon you in a second, but God is faithful to his promises to you in Christ. Your idols won't sacrifice anything for you. In fact, they require everything of you. But the one true living God, he has sacrificed his one and only son that you might be set free. What I'm saying is that your idols could never love you like God does. So do some comparison work and set your affection on him and when you do, your idols will begin to lose their power. See, the first step in defeating idols is to admit that they're really in your life. The second step is to see the greatness of God's love for us in comparison with the futility of our idols. And there's a third step I want you to see. The third step in defeating idols is to take responsibility and fight for holiness. Take responsibility and fight for holiness. Look with me, beginning at verse 21, as we continue the story. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we did not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> and when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did, according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. I want you to notice in that group of verses that there's a comparison here. There are two responses to being confronted with your idols. 
On the one hand, you have the response of Aaron. On the other hand, you have the response of the Levites. Let's take them one by one. The response of Aaron is to deny all responsibility. He makes excuses, right? We're meant to see that dialogue as comical. Moses confronts him. What are you doing? Aaron says, oh, you know, I mean, first of all, it's the people. They're the problem. You know those people. They surrounded me. They said we got to make this idol. So I say, okay, fine, fine, fine. Calm down, everybody. Hand me your gold earrings. And then I throw it into the fire, and it's like, voila, out comes this calf. It's total denial. The people made me do it. The calf made me do it. And this is so often our response to idols, right? We say things like, well, my spouse made me do it because she didn't love me like she should have, and so that drove me to pursue love somewhere else in that idol. Or we say, no, 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 my parents made me do it because they gave me these addictive genes. Or we say, no, my colleagues made me do it because everybody in the organization was telling white lies to increase the profits, you know? So I was just going with the flow. And we have a capacity to constantly make excuses about our idols. That's one response. But I want you to notice the Levites. They give us a second response. Moses says to the Levites, who is on the Lord's side? Step up. And they do. And Moses says to them, strap on your swords. We are about to start a civil war inside of Israel. And he commands the Levites to go through the camp. They're to draw their swords and kill anyone who is still in active rebellion against God and in partnership with idolatry. And so they go through the camp. The civil war ensues. They end up killing 3,000 people as a result. They took responsibility. That's what their response was. They took responsibility. They fought for holiness, and they were rewarded for it. Now, I want you to hear me. As God's people today, we are no longer living in a theocracy where we're a nation state ruled directly by God, where God can command his people to declare war. No, we're in a completely different epic now. As the people of God, as the church of Christ, we are never to use physical violence to rid ourselves of idolatry. We're never to pick up the sword in that way. However, however, we are told again and again in the New Testament that we should use spiritual weapons to fight a spiritual battle against our spiritual idols. Romans 8, verse 13 says, If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Or I think of Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul says, Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Or I think of Jesus in Matthew 5, where he says, Does your eye cause you to sin? Pluck it out. Does your hand cause you to sin? Chop it off. I don't believe that Jesus is literally asking us to do those things, but he's giving us a principle. He's saying, do everything it takes. Go to drastic means to rid your life of sin and idolatry. Friends, like the Levites, we've got to take responsibility for our idols and then fight for our holiness. We have to stop making excuses like Aaron did. Oh, it's my parents' fault. It's my friend's fault. It's my my genetics' fault. No, And like the Levites, we must be all in. Pick up the sword of the word of God and fight. Study it. Memorize it. And fight. Fight your idols with prayer. Fight your idols with the Holy Spirit's power. Fight your idols together in Christian community. Come to think about it, those Levites, as they stepped up to the plate, they fought together. We need one another too. See, here's the problem with many of us. We would rather manage our idols than eliminate them. We would rather keep the lion on a leash. We would rather just store our idols away somewhere, maybe back off in a back closet somewhere, rather than topple them, smash them, grind them to powder, and scatter them around. Philip Graham Ryken puts it this way. He says, quote, All too often Christians try to deal with their idolatries by putting them in the closet rather than taking them out with the trash. I wonder how many of you, brothers and sisters, are failing to find victory in your life over idols because you're choosing to manage your idols rather than going all in to completely destroy them. You're never going to find victory till you stop making excuses and take responsibility for holiness. What do you need to do today, brother, 
sister? What's the Holy Spirit telling you right now? Maybe you need to get others into your fight with you and tell another brother or sister about the idols that plague you and get their help in prayer and accountability. Maybe you need to spend more time with God's word, your sword, reading it, studying it, thinking it through in your daily life. Maybe you need to take some practical steps to cut some sin patterns out. Maybe you need to set up some guardrails in your life. Whatever the Spirit is telling you to do, brothers and sisters, do it. Go all in. Don't make any more excuses. Be like the Levites here. See, if you want to defeat your idols, first, you must admit the reality of idolatry in your life. That's the first step. Second, you must see the greatness of God's love over against the futility of your idols. And thirdly, you must take responsibility and fight for holiness. But you know, there's one final step I want to mention to you, and it's the most powerful one of all. If you want to defeat the idols in your life, fourthly and finally, You must bring your idols to the cross. It's the only way to be done with them. Even though 3,000 rebels had been put to death, the rest of the people of Israel were still implicated because they all participated in this idolatry. Moses knows this. He knows the people need greater forgiveness through and through. And so we read in verse 30, The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, an angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Don't miss the significance of what we just Read. Moses knows that God is pleased to forgive sinners through a substitute. Moses knows that in God's economy, the people can offer an animal sacrifice, an, in, in, an innocent animal sacrifice, in place of the sinner so that the sinner can be forgiven. But Moses here takes it to a whole nother level. He knows that idolatry goes so deep that no animal sacrifice will do. And what Moses does is he goes up onto that mountain as he says, God, forgive your people. But if you won't forgive them outright, then here's what I ask you to do. God, take me instead. Moses says, blot my name out of your book of life so that they, people can be forgiven and set free. In other words, Moses is asking for human sacrifice. He thinks nothing short of that will do. And here's the interesting thing. God rejects Moses' offer. God says, no, Moses, I won't, I won't stand for this. I'll give the people judgment. And he gives them a plague instead. It begs the question, why was Moses' offer rejected by God? Well, here's why. Because Moses himself is a sinner. Moses is a murderer, last time I checked. Moses will one day fail to get into the promised land because of his anger problem. Moses is a sinner and therefore he is an insufficient savior. He cannot substitute himself rightly for the people. But here's what we must not miss. By asking this question, Lord, take me instead, Moses is giving us hints of what God will eventually do to finally eradicate idolatry from our lives. One day, God actually will send a divine and yet human substitute for sinners. Motivated by his great love, God sends his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to come and live a fully human life. And then Jesus goes up onto the cross and takes all of our sins and all of our idolatries for us thereby paying off the debt that we deserve 
And now all who will turn to him and trust him by faith, they can be forgiven of all of their idolatries. See, here's what we're saying. The ultimate remedy for idolatry is Jesus on the cross because Jesus becomes an idolater. With your idolatry and mine, so that we can finally be set free. And if you want to be truly free, brothers and sisters, of your idolatries all the way through and through, then what you need to see is not just Jesus up there dying for nebulous humanity and nebulous sin and nebulous idolatry. No, you need to see Jesus up there dying for you. You need to see Jesus taking the idols that you face and literally they are nailed to him on that cross. And he is dying in payment for your idolatry. And then here's what happens. When you see Jesus there on the cross taking your payment for you, becoming an idolater for you, as you look at it and it melts your heart, you realize, by contrast, Jesus loves me and these idols don't. Jesus can fulfill me and these idols can't. Jesus can give my life meaning and purpose, and these idols never could. And as you stare long and hard at the love of Jesus, what it does is it topples over your idols, and they lose all their power in your life. And when you look to Jesus and make him supreme, you know what what ends up happening? Now your family and your career and your friends and your pursuits and your dreams, they no longer have to own you as an idol. No, no, no. They can now be received as gifts from God, rightly used under the authority of Jesus Christ. See, the ultimate remedy for idolatry is Jesus. When you see him there, it melts your heart and your idols topple. See, your job doesn't have to own you anymore. Your spouse doesn't have to fill the God-sized hole in your life anymore. Your material possessions don't have to own your identity. No, Jesus owns you. Jesus fulfills you. Jesus gives you significance. And all those other things have their rightful place under him. The ultimate remedy for idolatry is Jesus. So here's what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. Bring your idols to the foot of the cross. Bring them one by one and watch them lose their power because only Jesus loves you enough to have your heart. Let's pray. Lord God, it is painful when you do an archaeological dig on our hearts. We're a little scared of it, to be honest. When you open us up and you show us idols, it's scary. We don't like it. But our first prayer to you this morning, Lord God, is forgive us. Forgive us for making counterfeit gods and then giving our lives away to them. Forgive us for finding ultimate meaning and security in people or things or ideals. Forgive us, Lord God. Our second prayer to you, Lord, is that you would just enliven our affection for Jesus, that you would show us the depth of his great love, all that he did for us, the abundance of his grace. Let us see him clearly as our solution. But finally, Lord God, our final prayer in this moment is that you would show us your glory, that you would be the supreme object of our affection and our delight that you would be so beautiful to us that no idol is even tempting anymore because we see you so clearly and love you so much. Help us, Lord God, in these things. We cast down our idols this morning and we look to you. In the name of your son, we pray it. Amen.